Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Gavin Richard Presents. I am the one and only Gavin Richard, and welcome to another episode. Hope everybody's doing well. I've been busy traveling. Uh, had to go meet with some body today across in the city. And eh, I hope your weekend has been good. You know, we're back to work. And pretty soon the weekend's going to come back. That's the good news. <laughs> Yeah, man, a lot's been going on. I actually got to see the movie Girls Trip, which was pretty funny. Uh, you know, I think uh, Queen Latifah, Regina Hall, Jada Pinkett Smith, Tiffany Haddish, they're in the movie. Uh, Tiffany Haddish just sold the show. <laughs> I, the shit was just too funny. Um, you know, and I saw uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins, or I listened to a part of what his analysis of the film, and I can go into it a little bit. Um, but my thoughts, I thought it was a comedy. Uh, you know, yeah, it is raunchy and so forth. And most of the time we see Hollywood gives black people roles only if it's raunchy or they play, uh, you know, demeaning stereotypes sometimes. You know, we don't see positive role models and imagery, male role models at least in television or in uh, movies at this point. But, you know, it is a comedy. And I understood what Boyce was, uh, when he was talking about when he made the description about the ad and how, uh, you know, the tagline for the movie is basically, you'll be glad you came. And you'll see in that poster a picture of all four women, Jada Pinkett Smith and Regina Hall, Queen Latifah and Tiffany Haddish, who are just looking at this man's penis. Obviously, it's a, well, they don't see show it, but the image there, it's definite what they're looking at. And it, the tagline is, you glad you, you came. And yeah, it is a over, it's a sex comedy, uh, which is basically what it is. And it's marketed, but I wouldn't, it's marketed, to, it's R-rated, and it is marketed to black people. It is, uh, have the Essence Fest is located, is, uh, was shot, in fact, in the movie. I don't want to give everything away, but... You know, it is marketed towards blacks. And speaking of which, Essence Fest is not, a, uh, while it's marketed to blacks, if I'm correct, Essence Magazine is owned by Time Warner, which is a white company. So black people do not own uh, Essence Festival. I don't care how many black celebrities they have going there. They are marketed to those people, to our people, but the dollars are going into those white, you know, to the white owners of that company, the managers and the uh, CEOs, CFOs, all of them are getting percentages from that. And I'm not saying don't go to Essence Fest or anything like that. But anyway, I'm getting off subject. And what I wanted to talk about is three minutes in. Uh, I wanted to read with you all, and I had talked about this on my last video that I should be uploaded. I was talking about Michael Vick and Cooning. I wanted to deal with the O.J. Simpson parole hearing that was broadcast on uh, this past, I believe it was Thursday, and people need to pay very close attention to what's going on, and I'm speaking to us as African Americans in this country, because often when they have a black celebrity, like a O.J. Simpson and a Bill Cosby, laws get changed across the country, and there's some type of movement right now where people are angry and upset even with the own judicial system that they created that they decide they want to change the game right now uh you know there's right now just so that they can go and get back at this person when it affects everybody and so that's actually the uh basis of the episode or the parallel between the oj simpson and the uh, bill cosby trial and how it affects us to this day. And I'm going to give you some, as Tariq Nasheed says, some receipts and some information. I remember when I was a kid when the O.J. Simpson's uh, murder trial began. I was about eight years old when it started. Uh, I remember when he was, uh, when they announced his wife died. That was a Monday morning. I remember him walking from the police station. I remember news media even saying he wasn't a suspect, but then they would show at the same time uh, that same day he was in handcuffs. So if he wasn't arrested, he wasn't a suspect, why was he handcuffed? Uh, 
basically short and point, people have asked me, what do I think about it? I think that this was a murder that was committed by two different people. I don't care what anybody else says. I, there's no way for me to believe that a 47-year-old man with rheumatoid arthritis was able to kill two athletically fit people, one of whom, if my understanding is correct, he was a third-degree black belt, Mr. Goldman. And on top of that, he killed these people on the day of his daughter's recital with a knife. And he, le he is able to hide the murder weapon, but he leaves one glove at one place and another glove at his place. Something was off with that with me. It's not drenched in blood, bloody clothes, which they never find. They can only find a bl one bloody sock, which when they took the socks, the socks were both poured in on both sides, which seemed like someone had poured a vial on top of the socks because they were symmetric with each other. And all of this came out at the trial. But let me preface my arguments. Okay, so... I didn't believe that, and I watched and sat through the trial, and what happened, you had the news pundits like Geraldo Riviera, who was at the parole hearing uh, this Thursday, and Nancy Grace, who would all make these comments during the trial about how bad it was for the defense, how they didn't get this, this motion was denied, this motion was denied, you know, this is a win for the prosecution, they've got this motion upheld. They would only show you the parts where the defense would lose, but not when the prosecution would lose. And Carl Douglas, in an interview that he did, I believe it was on Carl Nelson's radio show just last year, because they were talking about the people versus O.J. Simpson. They, he went in detail about how they would win motions, a motion to suppress evidence, how they would get uh, items thrown out, but uh, could not be heard before the court how they damaged the credibility of their star witness of the prosecution's own witnesses. But you never heard anything like that. For instance, you don't still don't hear, and this is at the trial back in 94, there were, we don't hear about the airline pilot that testified at trial who got an autograph from O.J. Simpson, and his autograph, uh, his autograph that night, you know, was... Uh, was a peace and love or something, and he signed O.J. Simpson, number 32. He signed his flight log, and the airline pilot did not notice any cuts or bruises on O.J. Simpson. The cut that was found on his finger actually came from the Chicago, was came from a glass in Chicago when he found out his wife was murdered, and the Chicago police had verified that. But no one talks about that information. That all things get thrown out because people want to talk about Bruno Magnus shoes and how he was a wife beater, and you hear that line on ESPN with people like Stephen A. Smith, and I've already commented about him in previous videos. He's the go-to Negro uh, that gets on everybody's nerves and likes to talk, and I think he came out from vacation just to talk about that. But just keep it in parallel, white America in particular views black people and how I tie this, I'm tying this with the Bill Cosby situation in a minute. They look at black people as one big Negro. And what they do to them, it affects all of us, and we have to pay attention. So to tie that in with the O.J. Simpson case, I'm going to read this article from you. Uh, and, this is to, and I'm going to parallel and reference it with the Bill Cosby situation. This article came from Time Magazine. And Time Magazine, if you remember... They had that big uh, case or that big issue with uh, O.J. Simpson when they had him on the cover of their magazine and his skin color was even darker than what his natural skin color is because he's about my complexion. And let me just go in detail. And this was written in June of 2014, how the O.J. Simpson case helped fight domestic violence. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole article, but I'm just going to uh, give you uh, snippets of it. But I will post the link online so you all can uh, read it. Okay. OJ's history of battering the cold became a eureka moment in the national understanding of domestic abuse. 
The call had called the police on O.J. several times, most notably on New Year's 1989, when she appeared with bruises and a cut lip and told officers she feared for her life. But before the O.J. case, Smith says few people made the con connection between domestic abuse and homicide. There were some juror comments after the verdict that said, why were they talking about domestic violence when this is a murder trial, Smith said. But I realized the jurors didn't understand a connection between domestic violence and homicide and didn't know why domestic violence was being described to them. I realized that they were not doing a good enough job to get people to understand that this is a pretty common outcome. Let me stop you right there. Okay, now, while it may be true that domestic abusers may often, or not often, they can uh, murder their own spouse, their significant others, that does not prove murder. When you have to prove murder, you must be able to prove that this person, this is the burden on the state, specifically intended to take the life of another human being or to inflict great bodily harm. That's what murder is. And sometimes there's different categories of murder. Of course, you have the first degree, you have second degree. Uh, obviously, murder in the first degree is premeditated. Uh, there's felony murder where people are engaged with a crime, a felony crime like an armed robbery, and they have a specific intent to murder or inflict serious bodily injury to another person and that person dies. That's felony murder. Now, let me just go back and read this to you. Since then, domestic violence organizations have made a point of emphasizing the battery can lead to murder. According to a 2013 World Health Organization report on global violence against women, 38% of women who are murdered are killed by their, part, by their partners and 42% of women who are abused by their partners experience serious injuries. In 1996, partly as a result of the increased awareness, Congress passed a law that prevented domestic batterers from purchasing guns. So, right after the O.J. Simpson case, Congress decides to pass this law to prevent domestic batterers from purchasing guns. The next thing that happened as a result of the O.J. Simpson case was that billions of dollars, and this is from the same article, Smith said that the growing awareness about the pervasive danger of domestic violence was instrumental to getting the Violence Against Women Act passed through Congress in 1994. It really did spur a quicker passage of that law, Smith said. And that bill was the largest amount of funding directed towards the ish, this issue from the federal government. It was an enormous amount of money. The bill granted $1.6 billion of funding over six years and included provisions for mandatory arrest of abusers. So as a result of this case, Congress was able to pass a law to try and get money to these groups. Now, whether not saying at all that there's an issue with domestic violence, but this issue, especially in the O.J. Simpson case, was made and played out as particular by the media, by the press, by people like Nancy Grace and Geraldo Rivera, uh, who, and others in the press, I shouldn't just name those people, but those are some examples, where they're talking about domestic violence. And again, you must stick with the elements of the case and the facts of the case, the elements of the charge and the facts of the case. Now, I would recommend, and you all can look at this link, you would read the book by, a Stephen, Sing by Stephen Singular. He is a national uh, best-selling author. He writes true crime novels. And he wrote this book. I have it on my phone. It's called Legacy of Deception. This is, and in this book, there's a copy of it here. If you're able to read it, you should read it. But it's called Legacy of Deception, an Investigation of Mark Furman and Racism in the Los Angeles Police Department. In this book, Mr. Singular describes how he had an insider in the Los Angeles police force who told him whatever he was hearing about the blood evidence in the O.J. Simpson case, he said, do not trust it. And he was the one that told in his story Johnny Cochran and the defense team how to detect the EDTA that was in the blood because the EDTA in the blood is an indicate well not an indicator but it was proof 
that this blood was planted and they found it smeared on the Bronco. They found it smeared on the fence. They found it in the OJ socks. They never talk about this though on ESPN. Stephen A. Smith, you never answer these questions because you're up here cooning it up and you took off from your vacation just to talk about a parole hearing when if we all want to be honest with each other, look, the O.J. Simpson story and Tariq Nasheed, you know, he says this. It's a multi-million dollar industry. And the fact the O.J. did it industry, and he's specifically saying, you know, O.J. is guilty, is what makes hundreds of millions of dollars. And it has been a part of the media and in this country in the United States for hundreds of years are going back to Jack Johnson whenever a black man is accused of a crime, especially if it's involving a white person or a white woman, we gotta lynch that nigga. And, you know, that's what they thought of O. J. Simpson. Now I don't know if he understood white supremacy, I don't but I think he <laughs> he now that he's gotten out, maybe he's got a better understanding. Who knows what? But you know, it didn't see he was laughing it up and playing there. You know, I just was going to get my stuff. <laughs> you know, it's my stuff. But, uh, but no, to tie that back in and how it relates with, uh, you know, this case with Bill Cosby. Now, here's another article, and I'm, I'm tying it in. I know I've been off subject, but here it is. California passes a law inspired by Bill Cosby's scandal. This was September 28, 2016. Beginning next year, the new law will end the statute of limitations in certain rape and child molestation cases. The governor of California, Jerry Brown, signed the bill eliminating California's 10-year time limit for prosecutors to file rape and child molestation charges. Brown made the announcement without comment Wednesday amid a nationwide debate sparked by sexual allegations against comedian Bill Cosby. Beginning next year, the law... The new law will end the statute of limitations in certain rape and child molestation cases. It will also end the time limit on older cases in which the statute of limitations has not yet expired. The new law, SB 813, will not, however, help women who have made allegations against Cosby dating back more than 10 years. It's not going to help them. Why did you create this law? Cosby has repeatedly, that was my question. Cosby has repeatedly denied the sexual abuse allegations made by dozens of women nationwide. He is facing just one, one criminal case stemming from sex abuse. A trial is set to begin in June in Pennsylvania. Civil rights advocacy groups and public defenders say the California bill could lead to false convictions as memories fade among victims and witnesses. In June, I'm just skipping through. 17 other states already have no statute of limitations on rape, according to the California Women's Law Center. In June, Colorado doubled the amount of time sexual assault victims have to seek charges from 10 to 20 years, a decision also prompted by the Cosby allegations. Nevada extended this time limit from 4 to 20 years last year after testimony by one of Cosby's accusers. On Wednesday, afternoon, lawyer Gloria Allred, who now represents more than 30 women accusing Cosby of sexual misconduct, issues a statement to THR about the passing of the law. I'm not going to read that statement, but yes, this was, my question is, if this was inspired by Cosby and if it's not going to affect women trying to file charges, why did you pass this shit? Why was it passed? It's evident, and especially you got someone like Gloria Allred. You know, Gloria Allred has been involved with many of the bla uh, many black celebrities, from uh, O.J. Simpson to Michael Jackson to Tiger Woods to Mike Tyson, uh, now Bill Cosby. She has a habit of going after practically every black person, black who has money and who's rich. I never heard anything about her say about, uh, and maybe she has, but I haven't heard her talk about Donald Trump, and you know, grabbing him by the, you know, the president of the United States saying he grabs women by the pussy. I haven't heard her talk about Charlie Sheen, who's allegedly slept with all of these women while he was, he had while he had contracted and was diagnosed with the HIV virus. 
Don't you find it interesting that they're just going back and uh, blaming? She goes back and has all of these women, 30 women she's representing. Just listen to this. And most of these women are white. Let's be honest. So there is a parallel and connection with the O.J. Simpson and Bill Cosby case here. And my opinion, they have, and the connection is that whenever these, that both of these men have had laws changed as a result of the things they were accused of. And Bill Cosby has never been uh, convicted in court, neither has O.J. Simpson, except for the uh, charge that he had in Nevada, which, you know, that was just karma and revenge for, you know, what getting away with people thought was getting away with murder. Well, let me correct that. What white people thought he got away with murder, and they trumped up these charges, which is why I said, you know, O.J. should have just laid low. You know, I know they had his stuff, but, you know, for me, if I was on staying on code, understanding the game, I wouldn't have gone after it. For something is off and wrong when somebody tells you they got your stuff and you call the police and ask them for help, they won't help you. You call the Vegas police, you call the Los Angeles police and they didn't want to help them. That should have been a giveaway. But everybody in there had, you know, recorders on but O.J. Simpson. Everybody was taping it. So that was interesting when I'm watching the parole hearing, the guy, the victim, the victim, excuse me, who testif testified on his behalf was saying all of this was a misunderstanding and how Juice is a good man. And he actually testified against him, but he asked the prosecutor to... Uh, plead this one out and that he should get no more than one or three years. The judge was slipping on a slurpee talking about how she wanted to make an example out of him. Uh, you know, I don't think she was fair and, bi and unbiased. Uh, it was very clear that this was a vendetta and our judicial system in this case, in the O.J. Simpson case, has been used as a vendetta. Because if you think about it, the O.J. Simpson case you know, what Mr. Nasheed was talking about with Michael Jack, the Michael Jackson case, and I'll add that, and Bill Cosby, it is multi-million dollars in advertisement, in books, in magazines, in TV print, and radio ads when they talk about the trial. It's just, it's just very popular, and people buy up airtime for it. Companies are buying up airtime listening to this. It made millions of dollars. You have the uh, Cosby Accusers had their uh, TV show on A&E at one point. You had a O.J. Simpson special on TV last year this around the same time. So all of that is tied in, and especially now we that I've given you this information, people ought to be pay attention. And I know people don't want to necessarily associate with Cosby and O.J. or Michael, because they felt Michael, these guys were cooning. You know, Michael, I think, had a stronger fan base, and he understood the game a little bit more after that second trial, because he went uh, across the country, uh, not across the country, excuse me, he went overseas to Bahrain and lived there for a year or two, and I probably would have stayed over there. <laughs> you know. Because it was clear they were trying, I felt they were trying to go after that catalog he had. Uh, you know, they were also trying to stop him from buying Marvel Comics. That's, that, that's something I heard. I actually, if you go on YouTube and look up Pierce Morgan's interview with Joe Jackson, they talked about uh, that Google, uh, Google Michael Jackson and Marvel Comics video or audio, Mar Michael Jackson Marvel Comics audio clip, and it should come up on YouTube. And you'll hear it. And he was talking about buying this company and having amusement parks and so forth, which Walt Disney eventually, after Michael Jackson died, did. And sure enough, they got a movie studio. They got amusement parks. They got everything. There. So it's interesting. Interesting stuff. But, yeah, getting back to this OJ thing and how I and the Cosby thing, how these are big stories in the media. If you notice with the parole hearing, let's analyze this. When have you ever seen a parole hearing 
televised on national TV. It was never, never have I seen anything like that. Not even for the Charles, Judge Joe Brown even talked about that. Not even for the Charles Manson murderers when he came up for parole and his minions came up for parole did they ever televise this. You didn't have Geraldo Rivera on Fox News talking about, you know, how he got away with murder and uh, uh, talking about why, you know, why Manson should stay in jail and so forth. But he talks about OJ. And, you know, I had people, uh, my cousin was talking to me about why it seemed like I was defending OJ. And I was telling him, well, I don't necessarily care for him personally because I don't know him, but I don't like seeing somebody get railroaded by the system, regardless of whether I like them or not. If I'm not a fan, I'm not a fan. But I believe in fairness, and in this country, we'll presume innocent until proven guilty, and he was not proven guilty. And when you see this parole hearing, when you saw how they were, the questions they were asking, the fact he got a nine-year sentence on something that should have been a one-year suspended sentence for a simple theft, they upgraded this to a kidnapping because O.J. told the guy, don't move, and it should not have been a kidnapping. <laughs> I don't know how they can even come up with that. But, you know, that's white supremacy at work, and uh, we got to learn how to play the game, and, and uh, hopefully the information that I've provided for you, uh, you would research and read. I want to just, before I go, though, I've got a few minutes. This is about 26 minutes, so we're almost 30 minutes in. Uh, from that book, from Stephen Singular's book, I just want to read this too and point this out. Um, it had been told, this is, he's talking about the blood evidence in the O.J. Simpson case. All right? This is uh, Legacy of Deception. The internal affairs investigation that into this claim provided evidence that it was true. I'd been told about a blood preservative, EDTA, which could be detected in the crime scene blood drop holding O.J. Simpson's DNA. Now, the, what EDTA is, guys, is basically it's a preservative to prevent blood from clotting when they draw your blood. So it preserves the blood. So that is not an artificial compound. That's not a natural compound that you find in your body. And the fact that they found it on different traces, not just in clothing, it was on the car, it was on the, um, the gate outside Bundy. This led me to believe that this evidence was planted. And right there, you had reasonable doubt. But you're not going to hear this on ESPN because they want to stick with the OJ did it narrative. Now, let me finish. A man with more than 40 years of experience with EDTA, Dr. Frederick Riders had come into the courtroom and said that this anticoagulant was present in blood and had been identified as belonging to the defendant. Then FBI agent Roger Martz, while under oath, had agreed with the defense attorney Robert Blazier that he found something in the blood consistent with EDTA. Was the preservative, preservative just another fantasy? It had been told that blood evidence numbers 30 and 31 the red smears located on the console of Simpson's Bronco had not been present when the truck was taken to the fingerprint shed on June 13, 1994. A detective employed by the LAPD itself, Kelly Moldoffer, had taken the witness stand and had given testimony that substantiated this claim. She hadn't seen any of these blood smears several days after the crimes had occurred. I had been told that Furman and at least one other officer had driven over to Simpson's residence in the early morning hours of June 13th, well before Furman made the trip to 360 North Rockingham with Detectives Lane, Van Atta, and Phillips. This issue had also been raised in the courtroom when Rosa Lopez talked about hearing men's voices arguing on Simpson's property in the middle of the night. They knew they'd left the scene of a crime to go in search of something which was an unprofessional thing to do. The argument, it was explained to me, erupted in that something could not be found. Footnote, when Furman went there a short time later with the other three detectives, he had not, no trouble at all finding a key piece of evidence. I had been told that the blood swatch numbers 47 through 52 in evidence 
were not what they appeared to be. The prosecution said these blood drops had been picked up at Nicole's condo on the morning of June 13th, and later the test revealed that the drops contained O.J. Simpson's DNA. But on August 26, 1995, Dr. Henry Lee, widely regarded as the most renowned forensic scientist in America, if not the world, came into the courtroom and was asked by Barry Sheck about one of these drops. Lee said that after carefully examining four small blood marks on the paper packet that had been wrapped around the blood evidence taken from the condo, he concluded that the crime swatches could have leaked onto the paper only if they had been packaged when still they had been packaged when still wet. LAPD technicians, however, had already testified that the swatches had dried overnight before packaging. What did this mean? Sheck asked. The numbers don't add up, Lee replied. Dr. Lee replied. The only explanation I can give under these circumstances is something is wrong. Shrek, Sheck did not press Dr. Lee to go further, but the clear evidence was that someone could have gone into the crime lab the night of June 13th and tampered with the dry swatches or put Simpson's blood on them. So, what you have here is basically evidence tampering and obstruction of justice from what this from this testimony that Dr. Lee, Mrs. Detective Moldofer, and FBI agents March and Readers gave. Dr. Readers gave. We don't hear anything from the national media about it. Is it a conspiracy? Is it a ploy to just get people to buy into anything, buy magazines regarding the O.J. Simpson case and to be fixated with this matter? Why has this symbol, this man, been made a symbol of the racial divide in this country? Why, when black people do not control the media and the press, yet we have polls asking who thinks he's guilty, who's innocent, 25 years later? Is it because we're like Pavlak's dog when we ring the bell and our mouth salivates? I think, ladies and gentlemen, that there is clearly an agenda up at foot, and we ought to stay woke with this and with this Bill Cosby situation. So be smart, be strong, be safe. Uh, I may do a follow-up video on this because there's more to the O.J. Simpson case. This was the case that made me want to be an attorney in the first place. But uh, till that time... I'll probably do another one in a week. Just stay tuned. I'm Gavin Rishon. You all enjoy yourselves and have a good night. Peace and love, family.